Chapter 2 The Kidnap One particular boy stood and stared at the dancing puppets. He was particular in that he and a very few of the many other children were already attracting attention of the fair's tenders. This boy was Solomon. Solomon was many things to many people, barely known to a few, and of no consequence to those he had yet to meet. He could be as eager as a lobster waiting on the shingle, or as solemn as a mock turtle who was sobbing about his school days. He could be as sensible as a caterpillar puffing on a hookah, or as mad as a hatter, supping tea all day and singing about bats. He lived in a weird and wonderful world, a world contained within his weird and wonderful imagination. Most who knew him were convinced that he spent more time in his own world of swords and sorcery than the one around him. His books, his cards, his toys, his games were almost entirely immersed in the lands teeming with mythical beasties. His play, whether at home or during school breaks with his trusty friends come adventurers, involved role-playing out fantastic battles. Battles where silent, lumbering stone golems threw slow but devastating st strikes at scampering, chittering goblins, or heroic wizards made flamboyant gestures and called out cantrips to defeat the hissing, whispering wraith that was armed with a death spell, three chill touches, several cold bolts, and fifty hits. He would have never have guessed that his short life was about to take a new and drastic direction, a direction where fantasy would become frighteningly real. The puppets continued to dance. One puppet was a girl in a large red dress and green stockings. She had a pale, pretty face and carried a basket of roses, and she curtsied and swayed in time with the strange music. The other puppet was a tall man in a blue robe. His face was even whiter than the lady's, and he sported large ears and a wide grin. The patterns on his robes clearly marked him as a man of magic. He kicked his legs clumsily, almost wildly. He looked altogether awkward next to his demure dancing partner. The longer Solomon stared at the flower seller and the wizard, so the figures moved less like puppets How curious. more like people. The lady seemed to glare and frown at her tall, gangly partner, whereas he simply smiled back, revealing teeth a Tyrannosaurus would be proud of. Solomon chuckled at this scene and continued to watch until the puppets bowed and curtsied for the final time before whizzing back along their tracks to disappear behind the doors they had emerged from. With this distraction now gone, his gaze wandered towards the coloured panels painted around the organ. The first he examined was of a strange stone machine that best resembled a planetarium. The longer and harder he stared at it, the more detail he saw until suddenly the picture on the panel started to animate. It had cogs, wheels and sails that turned and rotated and revolved about a central core. He smiled the more at the wonderment of it all and studied the rest of the panels. Once again, just a few moments, each of the scenes also started to move. They showed many curious things. There was a small silver key that sparkled and span. An old stone tower surrounded by ravens that wheeled and circled above. A lighthouse on a mound. Waves could be seen breaking against it. There was a jar on a table with the contents murky. Solomon had to wait a little longer than expected for something to happen. But it did. There was a jerk of something within the jar and brown gloop spilled out and over the sides. Solomon flinched back just a tad. Yeah. Next was a large leather bound book with the pages flipped over rapidly and then followed three scenes showing a pyramid bursting through sand, through trees and then sinking within a city of odd flat topped buildings. The next panel portrayed a demon complete with flapping bat wings and glowering red eyes and the next panel showed a large ruined building, sands and shadows whipped about it. Then there was a series of scarecrows all twitching, then a mass of more demons clambering over many blotchy skinned people. The next panel under Solomon's scrutinising eye was a huge cathedral, lightning flashed and flickered about its five spires. And finally, the last painted panel showed an alien creature with six legs, two long pincers, 
a body like a beetle, and a head like something that had yet to be given a name. This image didn't move, even after Solomon waited and counted in his head to ten. Solomon hummed and shrugged and moved off towards one of the attractions. The ringleader never stopped his dancing and prancing about, yet he moved with an urgency and design. He had now counted four, just four, of the hundred or so children before him who had met the requirements. Each child of this quartet had fairish hair, pale skin and brown eyes. The ringleader continued to skip and hop and leap. But now he made an effort to usher and urge these four children towards one stall in particular. This was the Marquis with a tender, half man, half badger, sat and waited and scowled. The swing chair carousel was set up next to the organ. As Solomon approached, he looked at it sheepishly, ruffled his nose and continued to shuffle on to the next attraction. Spinning about in any form was something he always avoided, as giddiness and nausea would always follow. The tender of the carousel was a vast, round-shouldered man with great whiskers. He looked a bit like a walrus. No, a bear. With warmth in his eyes, he lifted children on and off the chairs between each turn. He was lifting a small girl when he spotted Solomon. The bear man hesitated. I looked oddly at him for a moment, before turning back to the cow's carousel and putting the girl in one of the swing chairs. He patted her head gently. Solomon trudged before the next stall, eager to have a go. There were over two dozen children of all ages clustered before it. Those at the front sported simple fishing rods and were busy trying to hook down dolls from a revolving central section. The tender was a small fellow with a long, thin nose, eyes that never stayed in the same place for too long, and a laugh that sounded neither like a bleating lamb nor a strangled cat, but somewhere between the two. This man was distinctly rattish, a five-foot rat in a yellow and black clown costume, but neither Solomon nor the other children seemed to notice this oddity, or maybe they had noticed, but they just didn't care. What Solomon did notice was that each and every child that took part in trying to hook a doll won, Mm. walking away gleefully with one of the never-ending supply of clowns that spilled out from the stall. As far as he could see, all the dolls were identical. All wore a bright blue costume, curly-toed shoes and a three-pointed hat ending with silver bells. Each of the clown dolls also had a head with a smiley face at the front and a sad face at the back. Some of the children had discovered that the head, when twisted, turned fully around. This was accompanied by a series of loud clicks. Solomon took a step towards the stall, but was bumped into, grabbed and then whisked around via the ringmaster away from the hooker doll stall and onto the next stall. The rat man saw this and exchanged glances with the ringmaster. Both winked at each other. Solomon turned and twisted and before he could push his dancing assailant away, The ringmaster had fled with a leap and a flourish. The wee lad frowned and regarded the stall he had now found himself manoeuvred towards. This one had many straw targets set on shelves. Numerous children, mostly boys, were firing hand-sized crossbows at these targets. The tender was dodging and weaving and sidestepping the dozen or so quarrels that whipped past him to strike the targets behind. He managed this with a surprising degree of grace and poise, despite wearing an oversized clown costume and being a bipedal wolf. The tender turned to face Solomon as he approached and smiled at him as he continued to dodge the quarrels, only his smile was more of a snarl. Solomon smiled back pleasantly. He then looked about the children surrounding the wolf man's stall. None of them seemed to take any notice of this tender's animal appearance. Solomon wanted a go at firing a crossbow, but suddenly the ringmaster appeared and interfered. There he was, blocking Solomon's route again. He pirouetted and bowed, florid and low. Solomon backpedalled and sidestepped past the wolf stall and on to the fourth attraction. This was a very tall and very hectic helter-skelter. Like wasps around ice cream, the lion's share of the children were here scrabbling up the winding stair and whizzing down the spiral slide, only to repeat the process again and again. 
Despite the Helder Skelter being the tallest and busiest attraction, it was its neighbour that drew Solomon away. The last of the fair's attraction looked to be a low, multicoloured castle, complete with ramparts and narrow windows. There wasn't the usual cluster of children here. The tender were sat on a bench in a cabin wearing a clown costume identical to the other three. He spied Solomon straight away as he approached. Before Solomon had turned to look at him, the tender reached behind his back and twisted a handle. This handle pulled a chain, which in turn rotated a cog. This cog released a latch, which had previously locked a panel. Now unlocked, the panel slid across one of the walls in the tent, hiding it from view. This in turn exposed another mirror, a mirror with a heavy iron ornate frame. Solomon turned to look at the tender in his cabin and saw him grinning back at him. The man was clearly a whir badger, for his hair was streaked with black, white and grey. The tender gruffly announced, See yourself through others' eyes. See yourself of different size. See yourself as short or tall. See yourself or not at all. He then waved a paw at the entrance to the tent and stared at Solomon with what he hoped was a challenging look. All Solomon saw was a man-sized badger in a clown costume, baring his teeth and with his eyes all a-squint. Above this tender a sign declared, The Twelve Mirrors of Widdershins. Solomon looked through the entrance into the gloom of the building, just as a young girl in a white nightdress stepped out of the exit, one of the clown puppets trailing from her hand. She giggled at him and skipped away, heading off towards the Helter Skelter. Solomon gave a shrug mm, and headed okay, I'll give into it a the go. tent. This was a hall of mirrors like no other. The tent was divided inside by numerous wooden screens, making the interior feel more like a maze. At each turn, a mirror was stood and positioned so that only one mirror could be viewed at any time and at any place. Solomon had expected to see his legs, body or head elongated or squashed in the reflections in the mirrors. This was always the norm. However, in the first mirror, he saw only fire. He looked over his shoulder, but saw only the stripy red, black and well, yellow canvas strange. of the wall behind. He looked back at the flames, and this time he saw his own face as part of the That's illusion. clever. He smiled, and a face made of fire smiled back. He winked, and received a fiery wink in return. Solomon then proceeded to gurn for all his worth, chuckling and giggling at the fiery mimic. When his face began to ache, he pressed on, and only had to take a few steps forward and then took a sharp right for mirror number two to present itself. This reflection bubbled, swirled and churned. A moment later, a watery face appeared, his own face, and this, to no surprise, mimicked his own expressions. Solomon spent less time here than the first and moved on, turning this way and that as he was led deeper into the maze. The next mirror formed his face from earth and mud, and the next from swirls and eddies of smoke. The fifth mirror was dramatically different. In this one, Solomon saw a seven-headed dragon, although That's unlike cool. the more conventional dragons he'd seen, he thought this image borrowed a lot from a carnitor. Mm, that looks like a dinosaur. Each head moved independently, and as they did, so each face on each head became a mixture of carnitor and Solomon. A solisaurus, even. After a minute of rapid expressions and rapid swaying, Solomon was unable to catch the mirror out, so he moved on through the maze. The sixth mirror showed Solomon as a huge black dog. The seventh, a twisted tree thrashing about in the wind. The eighth, a three-headed oh, dog. Dogs. The ninth was clever. On a lion's body, Severus. Solomon's face had been imposed onto a ram's head, a snake's head, and the head of a lion. At the tenth, he stopped Get and there. announced, All gone. To no one in particular. The image had him dressed in bronze armour and wearing a crown of hissing, spitting snakes. The eleventh mirror had him wrapped in spines, sporting a mane and having a scorpion-like tail arched over his grinning face. He spent less and less time as he progressed, the expectation of the next mirror outshining the amusement gained from the last. He arrived at the twelfth mirror. At first he saw nothing except for a I few wisps of dancing there. snake. Then, after a second or two, his reflection stepped forward as if hidden in shadow. 
Solomon peered into the mirror and his hair, or the hair of his reflection, seemed to waft around slowly as if he were underwater. The reflection also seemed to have lost some of its detail, appearing slightly blurred and grey. Solomon stood for a while, mm, this one's waiting different. and wondering if the reflection was going to do anything. It did. It smiled at him, and it moved closer to the glass surface. The haunting music from the organ continued to play, unbroken and never-ending, though a little louder here in this hall of mirrors. Solomon smiled back, and he also moved closer, thinking it amusing to copy his doppelganger. The reflection then put both hands against the surface of the mirror. Solomon could see his own fingertips pressed up against the other side of the glass. Solomon did the same, finger to finger, thumb to thumb. As fast as a fish through water, the doppelganger's hands grabbed Solomon's own, its grey fingers pushing through the mirror's surface and latching behind Solomon's with a firm, icy grip. Solomon <laughs> yelped and instinctively pulled back, seeing his own expression of surprise and fright on his reflection's face. The doppelganger held firm, then with a contorted snarl, it started pulling Solomon through the mirror in jerks and jolts. Solomon yelled over and over, get off me. Hear in return, get off. the haunting, whirling, fairground music. The doppelganger now held Solomon in a tight embrace, barely a centimetre from the mirror's surface. Solomon twisted his head to the side, desperately trying to keep his face from touching the mirror. The doppelganger's arms and hands, now wrapped around Solomon's waist, started to lose their grey and gain some colour, whereas Solomon could only look on in terror as his own limbs turned a deathly grey within the watery world of the mirror. With one final jerk, Solomon was pulled into the mirror, <coughs> no! and the doppelganger stepped out, passing through him as if it were a ghost. Solomon spun and tried to return through the mirror and back into the maze. But his movements were slow and sluggish, and it was so cold. His hands <sighs> met an invisible What's happening? where the mirror's surface would have been. The doppelganger looked over its shoulder and grinned wickedly at Solomon. It shook out its arms, cricked his neck, and strode purposely out of the tent. The badger man grinned and turned the handle the other way. This time the mirror with the trapped child inside slid back into the side and another, identical to the first, replaced it. That night the fair packed up and prepared to leave. When all the children, but three, had returned to their homes, the fairground organ lowered back into its cart, and the music ceased. The other four attractions also lowered, clunked, clicked and folded back into their own carts. Hundreds of households snapped out of a trance that had lasted just two hours. But before heads were shaken and questions were asked, over a hundred clown puppets came to life, puppets won and taken home by all the children. Under perfect synchrony, the heads turned around clockwise twice, and then anti-clockwise for just half a turn, and the music started to play from somewhere inside their little bodies. The tune was almost identical to that of the fairground organ, and so everyone was happy and free from confusion again. When the subdued families of Abergavenny had retired to bed, the clowns ceased their music, stood on wobbly legs and escaped. Some crawled through cat flaps, some through windows, some even up chimneys and down drain pipes. They all then waddled back to the field, to the awaiting carts. The carts then moved off. That night two of the three children were returned, none the wiser, telling their parents of strange dreams. One child was not returned. When morning came, just his pyjamas remained, still under the duvet and still in the sleeping position. It was almost as if the child, Solomon, 